Today on One. What's old is new. We'll visit a record store that's spinning again. It's a magical sport where, they, where players fire on their broomsticks and their magical flying balls. Then we'll catch up with players of a game made famous by Harry Potter that's rapidly growing in popularity. That's a good boy. And we meet a traveling vet that's helping control our cat and dog population. We've got all that and more coming up on today's show. This is One. Hi, I'm Amy Lo Cicero, and welcome to One, a show about the people and places that make Central Florida special. Coming up in the show, we'll visit a creative hub in Volusia County. But first, we take a trip to a museum that reveals the history of a local African-American community. There's a museum in Leesburg that's so small it's easy to miss, but inside you'll find artifacts and memories of the African-American experience in the area. We visit the Leesburg Museum and meet the people who lived through segregation and the Civil Rights era. The idea of the Leesburg African-American Museum came from the thought of preserving the history of, of Leesburg and Lake County and the struggle of African-Americans within our county and make sure that the younger generation knew the struggles and the past history and the successes of the African-American community and the contributions to the city of Leesburg. To grow up in Leesburg, uh, under the times in which we grew up in the um, 40s and 50s here in Leesburg, it was nothing as it is today. We, in turn, had to always go to segregated schools, always made sure that we, in turn, stayed in our places, so to speak. Everything was segregated, and, and, there was, and the schools were very much uh, segregated. I was an athlete. I played football, baseball, basketball. You did not play any, any white kids. You didn't even go to the games. Segregated uh, stores, and some stores, you know, you had water fountains for white and water fountains for colors. Well, growing up here, I um, heard about the Ku Klux Klan uh, walking down um, East Street, uh, walking down Main Street, African Americans not being able to walk on Main Street. The, the Klan would come around and threaten you to not to vote if, if you were registered. And they'd go all the way through the black community, down past the school, and they had their hoods on. There was a job uh, place on the East End, what was a truck place down there, where the large trucks would come, semis, and of course this was a white establishment, but they would always hire young black boys to come and wash dishes, sweep the floor, carry the trash out, clean the windows and things of that nature. I in turn made the mistake of cleaning all the windows and the doors and coming back in the front door. And the proprietor of course called me all kinds of names and told me that I would never come back in the front door of that establishment again. Well, I thought it was ironic at that time that here I am cleaning the doors, but yet I can't come in the front door. And talking to a lot of people who grew up in Leesburg, um, much older than myself, um, they talked about the, the history of Mike Street and the commerce here for the black community in years past. If you lived on Mike Street at that time, you were considered a stable family. We really had a, a popular area here on Mike Street. There's the barber shop, the funeral home, the Mason Lodge and all, the rooming house. We had everything contained in this area. Everything that pertained to black people was in this area. I think the museum is important here because um, our descendants need to know what, what our race went through to get us to where we are now. We got, we got a black president. That was, that was unheard of, you know, back in my day. When they tell me that African Americans couldn't walk down Main Street or if a white person walked down, you had to get off the sidewalk. For me, for a lot of young people, that's unheard of, unimaginable. And now we have a bronze statue of an African American lady reading a book to her grandchild sits on Main Street of Leesburg, Florida. So that history is, is a prominent uh, statement that, you know, there's differences being made in our city. And I think that, that's my goal, is to make sure people are taking advantage of the many opportunities that are afforded to them. 
I want the museum to celebrate our survivorship, our thriving, every person that, uh, that cleaned a house, that watched somebody's babies, that did somebody's laundry. These are the people that were sort of the glue of the community and that those are the people that we want to honor as well as the ones that went on to do greater things. All of us are a part of it and we, each one of us needs to be celebrated. The museum opened in 2009 and is always expanding its collection. Admission is free. In the digital age of MP3s, CD and record stores have all but disappeared. But for the avid vinyl collectors, it's the love of music that keeps them coming to Rabbit Foot Records in Titusville. In this month's edition of Central Florida Hometown, we see what it takes to make a vinyl record. I started collecting records like 20 years ago. I kind of fell into that because CDs were coming out around that time, except I grew up really, really poor. And so at the same time, everyone was like dumping off all their vinyl records at the thrift stores. I would go find Violent Femmes, Kiss, uh, The Misfits. My friends were coming to school. I got the new Nirvana album, 15 bucks. So I got the new Violent Femmes album for a quarter, you know? I find it weird that the, you know, the people who, who don't love music, who aren't all about it, and you meet those people every once in a while like, eh, uh, no favorite bands, no, no, I don't really, you know, collect music. For me, that's, that's bizarre. Music is, is life. Music's a way of expression. The visceral experience of like dealing with customers and meeting people, building relationships, you know, with, with people like based on music, and I feel like we're doing something. We're in a very small town. Titusville is a, a tiny town, you know? And I feel like we're doing something to bring a little bit of culture back to this town that's been missing for a while because there was no other independent music store here. You know, a little more than 10 years ago, all these big box retailers really started making all the smaller stores tank. A lot of people tell you, yeah, music sounds better on vinyl and it's a more visceral experience over the digital format. When it comes to vinyl records, it's a tangible experience. You have to love vinyl to have it. You have to take care of it. You know, you have to make sure it's standing upright, it's not getting warped, it's not, you know, getting dusty or anything like that. We're CDs, no one cares. Digital's more of like a sterile sound. It's more processed, more clean. Whereas on a record, there's nuances that are hidden in the grooves. We do cut records for, for bands and just people want to come off the street. Maybe they have a greatest hits they put on CD of their own stuff they like. I can do a one-off 12-inch of all their favorite stuff so they can listen to it on vinyl at home. Since we are cutting on a turntable, um, and the reason we use this one is because I can control the pitch. I mean, once this cutter head comes down on it, it changes the drag that's on the, on the record. It kind of slows things down. So as that's going around, I can take this tone arm, this cartridge, drop it down on the record, and through a monitoring system, with about a one second delay from what I'm doing, I can listen to, on my, on my monitors, what I'm cutting. All those things that people like about vinyl records is what I have to kind of work into what we're doing here. I think our biggest market for us cutting vinyl records is is like independent bands, local bands, or even we've done some bigger bands. We've, we've done bands in Europe and that sort of thing that, that want a handcrafted product, limited edition, limited quantity. Uh, I think locally, I think probably in the state of Florida, we're the only ones that do it in this context, like with a record store, uh, doing it for local bands, um, like in the setup that we do. The record we were just cutting, this is the final product. So we do a fold over cover, and he wanted two, uh, two front sides. Back when we were kids, we wish on a star. At least once a month, we have like different local bands or even traveling bands. Uh, come play in the store. We've had bands as far away as Portland, Oregon, Detroit. Just being open, more people have started collecting records in this community. Um, and then even the outside community, we get a lot of business from, you know, as far away as Daytona or Orlando. Um, last week we had some guys from Northern Ireland find us on an app. We have a lot of like really rare nuggets that, you know, some of the other stores don't have in really good condition. We go out of our way to find it. 
Rabbit Foot Records carries turntables and even current local bands records that were made right in the store. To check out more for yourself, visit rabbitfootrecords.com. Coming up on One, an artist hub of creativity in New Smyrna Beach that's revitalizing the community. But first, let's take a look at some nonprofit events and opportunities in our community. In the heart of New Smyrna Beach, there's a special building called The Hub that is cultivating the talents of local artists as well as helping to revitalize the downtown area. It's not just a gallery of artwork, it's also a place for artists to share their passions for creativity with visitors and locals. The Hub started because I got involved in city planning, but this works all over the country. It's local products. And if somebody comes to an area and likes it and they want to take something home to remind them of that place, this is truly the essence, the work here of New Smyrna Beach. Our artists come from Ormond Beach, across to Deland, and down to Oak Hill. I teach watercolor. I also work in acrylics. And um, right now I'm working on an experimental piece, which is on um, freezer paper. And this is my students' work up on the wall. And we, we paint on everything but traditional watercolor paper. We don't use traditional tube watercolors. We use liquid watercolors. And we paint on roofing paper. This is one that I'm working on right now, which is on roofing paper. And we also paint on plaster. I've always been interested in art, but I couldn't draw a straight line. I started out as a geologist. I worked for Texaco for 30 years. I was a geologist for Latin America and West Africa. And I saw some birds at a gallery in Hilton Head. And I said to myself, self, you can do that. And so I just taught myself how to do it. Basically, you start out as trying to replicate the personality of the bird. Otherwise, you end up with just a chick on a stick. There'd be little bitty a uh, bird, which is a little bee hummingbird, which is the world's smallest bird, up to the eagle head that I've done, and uh, so it makes no difference. I, I haven't got a favorite. What I want to do is learn and know. That's the objective. I am from Venezuela, and I have been here for 15 years already. When I was in Venezuela, I used to make the shoes. It was like 28 years ago. Uh, people in the little, little towns used to make the soles for me by hand and I fall in love with the process of the jute because it's a hundred percent natural and they wash the jute in the river and make the braid you know everything was beautiful so I wanted to make shoes out of that and I started making them like two and a half years ago I found the soles online I just start making my shoes again I quit my job I was working for the bank system for a long time and I just quit my job and got home and told my husband, I quit my job, I don't wanna work for the system anymore because I wanna follow my passion. I'm really happy doing this. It's not easy to follow your passion, but it pays to, to do what you really love and you really want. I think art is important because it speaks of the area. It speaks about the people who live here. It speaks about their creativity. It speaks about the town and what we really are. We've got over 70. I include there the artists who teach and the artists who teach once or keep their classes going. Um, they are truly artists. Yoga, meditation, movement, dance. Meeting the public as they come through a place like this, to me, is just as as, as rewarding as actually doing the bird itself. I like people. Many, many of these people could not afford this sort of premises on their own. So it's a co-op, it's an incubator system, it's, it's just wonderful. 
um, and it, it gives me a huge sense of pride when they make their sales. About 70 artists are represented at the Hub, and although it's only been open for a year, it has been so successful there's already a waiting list for studio space. Coming up, it's the vet that comes to you, how a local pet service is helping residents manage their pet population. But first, let's check out some upcoming events from around the area. If you have a story idea, let us know by emailing us at one at ucf.edu. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you'll recognize this iconic game from the books and movies. Players describe it as part rugby, part dodgeball, and part soccer, but with a bit of a twist. Quidditch is gaining a worldwide following as we caught up with a recent international tournament in Kissimmee. So Quidditch is based off the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling, and in the books, it's a magical sport where they where players fly around on broomsticks and there are magical flying balls, and it's been adapted so people um, in the regular world can play. The broom is actually not very hard to run around with at all. It is that handicap to this game. Every sport out there has its handicap. Basketball, you have to dribble it. Soccer, you can only use your feet. Well, in Quidditch, we have a broom and we have to hold it in between our legs and play with one hand. So what you do is you have seven players on each team. There are three chasers, they have white headbands. They pass the quaffle of volleyball um, to each other, score through the hoops. There are three goals on each end of the pitch. There's also a keeper who defends the goal hoops. There are two players in each team called beaters. They wear black headbands. They have dodgeballs or bludgers and they try and hit people of the opposing team. There's also a seeker on each side, which is the position that Harry Potter plays. And in this version, you, play, you wear a yellow headband and a snitch runner wears yellow shorts with a, with a Velcro tag on it, which is like flag football. And the seekers need to try and grab the snitch. So they try and grab the snitch off of the snitch runner. I personally am a beater on the field, which means I play essentially dodgeball. It's a very defensive position. It's also a very physical position because you're normally having to tackle other people. It does look silly when you're running around on room six, um, but that kind of gives a lightheartedness to it. But also, to be honest, it's more um, it's more a hindrance than anything. You have to learn to maneuver with the broom. A lot of the sport is played one-handed. Um, you're tackling, you're running, everything one-handed. And when people walk by, they know they know what sport you're playing. In the Quidditch World Cup this year, the University of Texas beat out 60 teams to take the championship, winning against UCLA with a score of 190 to 80. As many as 7 million cats and dogs are surrendered to animal shelters nationwide each year. But one Central Florida County is taking positive steps to reduce the number of unwanted pets by providing a much needed service for qualified owners through its Pet Vet Cruiser. This is Bodhi. So we'll kind of see if you've got any issues. Good boy. Got some cooperative patients today. The Pet Vet Cruiser set out about six years ago. Um, our purpose was to offer affordable spay neuter to the residents of unincorporated Volusia County for their dogs and cats. Okay, and Simon. For most of our clients, uh, because you have to be on some kind of government assistance, you, you either have to be on Medicaid or food stamps, it usually runs $15, and that's for the surgery. We also uh, do rabies vaccinations and issue county tags. We travel around Volusia County to different locations. We set up and we do low-cost spay and neuter. 
We also vaccinate uh, for rabies if the animal is not currently up to date on the rabies vaccine. Today, we have a combination of cats and dogs, and some cats that we have are what we call free roaming cats. These are cats that don't really belong to any one person. Uh, they have caregivers that go to their colonies and feed them, and then they try to get them spayed and neutered so they can cut down on the population of strays that are out there. And what they do is they put food in, into the trap, and the cat goes in and hits a lever, and that sets the trap off, and the cat is, is enclosed into the cage. And they bring the entire cage to us. Sometimes these cats can be handled, and sometimes they can't. Six points. Oh, it's like seven. We usually can do up to 20 surgeries per day. We get a combination of cats and dogs, different ages, anywhere from three months of age up to eight years. This dog is just four months old now, this puppy, and she's pretty little, she's under four pounds. But as I'm looking at her, she's bright, alert, responsive. Her gums are pink, they're moist. Um, her eyes look good, you know, her ears are clean. Um, take a listen to her. And her, her heart sounds normal. I feel like in a puppy, I'll feel if they have a hernia or anything like that. And so she's, you know, she looks like a very healthy puppy. Um, so I don't have any problem doing, you know, doing a surgery on one this little. People have to bring their animals at 9.30 in the morning. We ask that they be free of fleas and ticks if possible, bathe them ahead of time, dogs on secure leashes, cats and carriers, and then they pick them up later that afternoon. You really have, um, a variety of anesthetics that I can choose from so I can choose what's actually best for that patient. Um, what we don't have that a, a regular clinic would have would be the ability to actually take x-rays and check the chest um, or to do an EKG. We have since we started done a little over 12,000 surgeries. Cat neuters are very quick. Um, it only takes about, it takes them longer to prepare the animal. Um, than it does for me to do the surgery. Um, cat space, about 15 minutes, 10, 10, 15 minutes unless they're unless they're pregnant. To neuter a dog, about 10 minutes or so. Dog space, it depends a bit on their on their size. You know, the larger the larger dogs, the dogs that are a little chubby and have more fat are going to take longer. They might take half hour. Um, the smaller dogs, like the little puppy we have on board today, will probably only take like 10, 10 or 15 minutes. Most dogs uh, are kind of back, almost back to themselves the next day. Pet owners must call ahead to the Volusia County Animal Services to book an appointment with the Pet Vet Cruiser. The owners must also have proof of residency and meet the qualifying income levels. Thanks for joining us this month on One. I'm Amy Lo Cicero. We leave you with a look at more creations by artists from The Hub in New Smyrna Beach. We'll see you next time. Thank you.